For more than 2,000 years, the sword had been an emblem of power and chieftainship when the advent of chivalry brought it to its fullest glory. By about 1150, it had attained a complete symbolism. To all the ancient traditions was added the final touch of Christian sanctity. The form it had developed during the Viking Age was easily adapted and made holy by the church, and the cross which it formed became a protection against sin, a reminder that its owner must use it well in the protection of the church and to the confusion of the enemies of Christ. Its two-edged blade stood for truth and loyalty, one side for the strong who persecute the weak, and the other for the rich oppressors of the poor. I find the idea of a fake sword to be a concept that becomes increasingly interesting the more you really stop and think about it. It is a deceptively simple turn of phrase that belies the complexities within because of the polysemous nature of language. To a child, a fake sword may simply be whatever longish object they have to hand, which grants some physicality to their play. To a collector of Shingunto, a fake sword would be the mass-produced imitations which have flooded the collector's market and are the bane of the R-Sword subreddit. To an archaeologist, a fake sword would be the clever and clumsy forgeries which occasionally turn up in private and museum collections, chronologically more recent objects which purport to have the provenance of older items. To an aficionado, a fake sword would be the so-called sword-shaped objects, those abominations spawned from flea markets, anime conventions, online retailers, and magazines which haunted the dreams of the denizens of Sword Forum International, Sword Buyer's Guide, and My Armory. All would recognize what makes something a fake sword, but the commonality of disparity is what I find eminently fascinating. The criteria for what makes a sword a fake is intrinsically tied to properties related to its physicality, to its status as an object. Distilled to a pure valuation, the properties of authenticity and functionality are of primary significance. These properties are what engender a sense of the real into these objects, and so when they are lacking or absent, a dissonance arises which needs to be addressed. This lack, though, is not in and of itself universal among the criteria used to determine what makes something a real sword. In the case of a sword-shaped object, it is a distaste for the ahistoric, the implausible, and a very real concern for quality control. In the case of the archaeologist, it is the deliberate act of forgery and the risk of being deceived which establishes the falsehood. And in the case of the collector, it is a combination of the lack of authenticity and quality which causes a panic about the value of the sword you just inherited from your great uncle's estate. But removed from the contextualization of these qualifiers, what you are left with is an object that would still be viewed, would be understood by most people, as something which would be called a sword. The most fascinating of all these examples, though, is that which is established through the imagination of the child. Any item, a detailed prop from a Halloween costume, a foam buffer, a suitably sturdy stick, even the handle of a flashlight, can all act as stand-ins for the authentic object. The child is acutely aware of the arbitrary nature of their plaything, that none of these objects are real, but they can nevertheless conceptualize a degree of reality that enables them to play with swords. In 1985, during the excavation of a portion of Old Town in Stockholm, the Tritonia neighborhood to be precise, a remarkably well-preserved sword was discovered. It would eventually find its way to the Museum of Medieval Stockholm, and in due course, the museum would commission swordsmith Peter Johnson to reconstruct the sword, to present the artifact in all its pristine glory. This was the genesis of the Albion Tritonia sword, a Type 13B according to the typology developed by Ewart Oakshot. The original artifact and Johnson's original commission are still on display in the museum to this day, 
and Albion Swords has a limited number for sale through their website. Whereas representation attempts to absorb simulation by interpreting it as a false representation, simulation envelopes the whole edifice of representation itself as a simulacrum. According to Jean Baudrillard, the process by which a simulacrum comes into being, something he called the successive phases of images, occurs in the following manner. It is the reflection of a profound reality. It masks and denatures a profound reality. It masks the absence of a profound reality. It has no relation to any reality whatsoever. If you were to search for an Oakshot Type 13B, you would not find among the top results the artifact currently housed in the Museum of Medieval Stockholm. If you instead search for Tritoniosaur, it is the very first image which appears, the rest being images of the model sold by Albion. This is not surprising. After all, the only reason there is an image of the artifact to be found online is because of its association with the Albion model. The image precedes the real. A ready rebuttal would be to point to the artifact, an objective example of something which is real, something that no amount of sophistry will be able to erase. Though upon recollection, you may realize that in our procession of the image, the photo of the artifact was the second stage. It was already preceded by the illustration of Oakshot's Type 13 models. The model, the typology, is ultimately what has no reality. The profound truth which the illustration is supposed to reveal is the existence of an Oakshot Type 13B. But this is a designation which is wholly mediated. And so unless you are willing to posit that Oakshot merely discovered, rather than created, the typology which bears his name, typologies need to be recognized as being of wholly artificial construction. Having a recognized model upon which to construct our understanding of objects is not something which is especially problematic. Typologies and databases have been around for a very long time. So do not mistake this criticism for rejection. Rather, in service to the broader project of exposing the mediated nature of our contemporary experience, avoiding the pitfalls of ahistoricism which can result from anachronism will lead to a more historically situated understanding of the past. After all, at a second level, any typology is an attempt to bring theoretical order into the chaos of a perceived reality, and the urge to arrange reality in a proper order has sometimes led to typology for the sake of typology, and to evolutionistic oversimplification. As warfare marched hand in hand with industrialization, and as combat became increasingly mechanized throughout the first half of the 20th century, the use of the sword as a weapon of war was gradually phased out. The British Army retired the use of swords the year the Great War ended, and despite not having been used in combat for decades, the US Cavalry officially retired the sword in 1934. The Imperial Japanese Army continued to issue, manufacture, and train in the use of Shin Gunto until the end of the Pacific War, a fact which no doubt contributed to the vaunted status Nihonto would have in the popular imagination of the post-war era. The presence of swords on the battlefield would recede, and the value of the sword as a weapon would fade with this transition. But objects are not imbued with worth based on their use value alone. Man is not at home amid pure functionality. He requires something like that luster of the wood of the true cross which could make a church truly holy, some kind of talisman, a shard of absolute reality ensconced, enshrined at the heart of ordinary reality in order to justify it. In 1985, the J. Walter Thompson Agency was contracted to create an ad for the U.S. Marine Corps to run during Super Bowl XX. The ad they produced was simply titled, Sword. You begin with raw steel. Shape it with fire, muscle, and sweat. Polish it to razor-sharp perfection. 
We're looking for a few good men with a medal to be Marines. We were trying to find some symbol or some icon of the Marine Corps. In particular, the dress blues uniform is so unique. The uniform is always very crisp and just great looking. One of the things that appealed to us was their sword. It just seemed to be an ideal item to work with. And so it happened very quickly. It was one of those special projects where the idea happened and it changed very little by the time it got produced. In December of 2018, an article discussing the USAF's Order of the Sword was published on The Drive. It features several images of the bearing swords which are used to open the proceedings of the presentation ceremony for the award. The Order of the Sword is an award which is the highest honor enlisted personnel can bestow upon an officer. And despite the attention-grabbing headline, the swords which are actually awarded are of a more traditional Masonic style. The first time the USAF awarded the Order of the Sword was in 1967. This despite the fact that the USAF has never issued swords to its members to use in combat, and aside from a specific guard post, swords are not a component of the parade or dress uniform. According to an article written by Staff Sergeant Nick Wilson in 2016, the basis for the Order of the Sword was that, in 1522, King Gustavus I of Sweden enjoined the noblemen he commissioned to appoint officers to serve him. Accountants, builders, craftsmen, teachers, scribes, and others responsible for conducting the ordinary daily affairs of the kingdom. The system worked so well, it was incorporated into the Swedish army as a way to establish and maintain a cohesive, disciplined, well-trained force to protect lives and property in the kingdom. These ancient enlisted personnel would honor their leader and pledge their loyalty by presenting him with a sword. The use value of the sword as a weapon, what we call its primary order function, was never something which bore any relevance to the USAF, and one of their highest military orders is predicated on an imagined connection to a 16th century Swedish king. This is the sword as a concept, as an image, as a pure sign. There is a sequence in the Guardian Angels of Desire Part 1 section of the Black Swordsman arc of the Berserk manga, where Guts has just dispatched several guards, and one of the number asks, what kind of sword is that? The narrator's reply is something of a refrain throughout the series. It was much too big to be called a sword. Massive, thick, heavy, and far too rough. Indeed, It was like a heap of raw iron. And yet, and yet no one, not the guards, not the narrator, not even the audience for a moment would hesitate to call this a sword. Why? It doesn't look like any existing sword. It doesn't have the characteristics to allow to fit into any existing typology. So what is it that allows the reader to understand that despite all of this, the Dragon Slayer is a sword. It's because images, the images which comprise visual media, exist within the framework of language, and there is an entire developmental history behind what visual signifiers encode an object as a sword. A blade of some length, longer than the handle. A handle for one or two hands. The ability to be carried by a person, and that it is used like a sword. This is possible for the simple reason that the first order function, the use value of the sword as a weapon, has been superseded by its second order function, as a signifier of martial prowess. Swords have lost their materiality and have been transformed into pure simulacra. In the media and consumer society, people are caught up in the play of images, simulacra, that have less and less relationship to an outside to an external reality. In fact, we live in a world of simulacra where the image or signifier of an event has replaced direct experience and knowledge of its referent or signifier. Consider that for the vast majority of individuals, where their initial experience of a sword is going to occur is going to be in some image or depiction of a sword rather than the object itself. Even among those who have access to physical specimens, the majority of these will most likely be props for Halloween costumes, cosplay, 
toys, or perhaps one of those sword-shaped objects I mentioned earlier, hanging on a wall. It will be a very small contingent of people whose first experience will be with an antique or replica of some historic sword. For any object whatsoever, in fact, the reality principle may be put in brackets. No sooner does an object lose its concrete practical aspect than it is transferred to the realm of mental practices. In short, behind every real object, there is a dream object. In a 2017 interview with the BBC, set decorator Roger Christian explained the origin of the lightsaber. I knew this lightsaber was the Excalibur of this film. I knew it would be the iconic image. It was amazing. I went to um, Brunnings in Great Marlborough Street, who we rented all our photography equipment, anything we needed, and I'd buy equipment there. I just said to the owner, do you have anything here that's unusual, stuff that might be interesting? And um, he pointed me over the side of the room. He said, there's a load of boxes under there. I haven't looked at those for years. Go and have a rummage through. And it was the first box. It literally was covered in dust. And I pulled it out, opened the lid, and there was tissue paper. And then when I pulled it open, now it goes into slow motion, you know, the music rising. And out came a Graflex handle from a 40s press camera. And I just took it and went, there it is. This is the Holy Grail. And there was about five or six in there. We bought the lot. I raced back to the studios got my T-strip, stuck that round the handle. I stuck seven round it. From a calculator I'd been breaking down, there was a bubble strip that illuminated the numbers and they would magnify. And it just fitted into the clip, so I just cut it, stuck that in. I said, I think I found the lightsaber, George. He came over, just looked at it and smiled. I mean, that's, that's the biggest approval you can get from George. He just smiled and held it. The lightsaber is the abstraction of a sword, retrofitted with a sci-fi gloss and imbued with all its cultural signifiers, an elegant weapon for a more civilized age. This civilizational sidearm remains as potent a weapon as ever, yet it has become unmoored from its own materiality, what Derrida would call a floating signifier. It is this lack of materiality, of the loss of the palpable connection to physical objects, which allows for the simulacra to erase the real. Forms themselves also become more autonomous as they diverge further and further from a morphology founded on the human body, yet they continue to elude thereto in one way or another. They organize themselves independently, but their former relationship to primary function subsists in the abstractness of the sign. This is their connotation. With this utter detachment from the real, the sword is free to take on the appearance of a variety of implements. Yet the signified remains perceptible enough to maintain the semblance of the sign, and the signification extends across cultural and linguistic barriers. Through the procession of the image, even the recognizable encoding begins to fade, and swords, and what they are capable of, become limited only by the imagination of those producing these images. The real recedes, and in its place we discover that these contemporary mediations are altering our understanding of swords of the past. It is safest to grasp the concept of the postmodern as an attempt to think the present historically in an age that has forgotten how to think historically in the first place. As I've mentioned throughout, in contrast to the majority, there is a minority which does have access to the sword through a solidly material basis. And it is here where collectors, aficionados, archaeologists, and martial artists re-enter the discussion. The proximity to materiality is what enables a rootedness to the real. And so it should come as no surprise that those who do maintain this connection tend towards a different perspective than the wider audience of media consumers. Any material object constitutes the intersection between social context and the codified connotative ideologies of social practice on the one hand, and the material objective production or design practices which produces the object world on the other. This does not, of course, mean that the experiences of these groups are any less mediated, only that because they are closer to the object itself, that the significance of the first order function becomes a much more important element of their experience. 
their understanding given the appearance of being more grounded in the real. And yet, and yet despite this, there remains an insurmountable distance between these groups and the past. Moreover, the function of antique objects in this context exists only in the sense of a function that is extinct. As much as archaeologists will catalog, collectors gather, aficionados post, and martial artists spar, they will simply never use the sword to defend their lives or take the lives of others. As close as they are to the use value of the sword as a weapon, they will never really use it as such, not in the same manner it was used historically. Unless there is a sudden boom in the sword as an accessory of daily fashion once again, even secondary use functionality remains the purview of specialized spaces. It is this artificiality, this position which approaches but never quite reaches the real, which renders the spaces occupied by these specialist groups as hyper-real. The Renaissance Fair, the display case, the dealer room, the tournament floor, and of course, the subreddit. All of these spaces are permeated with a disjointed sense of temporality, of a space which exists outside of history, but is predicated on its presence. Cultural production is thereby driven back inside a mental space. It can no longer gaze directly on some putative real world, at some reconstruction of a past history, which was once itself a present. Rather, as in Plato's cave, it must trace our mental images of the past upon its confining walls. If there is any realism left here, it is a realism that is meant to derive from the shock of grasping that confinement and of slowly becoming aware of a new and original historical situation in which we are condemned to seek history by way of our own pop images and simulacra of that history, which itself remains forever out of reach. Even with sword in hand, we are made only minutes closer to the past, clinging as we may to our typologies and treatises, willing them to give weight and significance to these objects upon which we project meaning, and by which we are ourselves imbued with a sense of profundity. It is precisely this proximity to materiality which obscures, paradoxically, just how much the sword has transitioned into a simulacrum. Contemporary smiths have access to more refined materials, more precise measurements, access to centuries of documentation, and the benefit of high-quality mass production techniques. The hyperreal makes itself visible when the reconstruction, the simulation of the artifact, becomes the image of the real. It is more real than real, as it has become the only existence. I hope you enjoyed this video. Postmodernism, despite all the negative rhetoric around it, is an intellectual position which I find has a lot to offer in terms of cultural criticism. It is complex, to be sure, there was a lot of reading to get to a point where I felt comfortable enough to present this analysis. And if it is a subject anyone wishes to explore more detail, as always, I have my sources listed in the video description. I would especially recommend the works of Madan Sarup, Mark Gottdiener, and Frederick Jameson. Baudrillard's System of Objects, while not technically a postmodern text, contains several hints of a lot of the ideas which would appear in his later works, but is both much more accessible and a striking work of materialist semiotics. As always, like or dislike as you choose, comment, share, and if you want to see what else I've done, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for your time.